TLO, what's poppin'? We are on Twitch. We are not live. But you can leave a like, comment, subscribe, turn on your post notification bells. Let's continue to grow the family. From Chicago to the UK, right behind me, you see a little warning screen just in case. Don't forget, we do got Patreon. Hey, a lot of y'all been coming to Patreon. I told y'all I would not mislead you. We post there seven or ten times a day a week. UK highlight, I mean, UK um, TV shows, UK movies, and uh, Premier League highlights, man. Also, twitch.com is where you can catch a live stream. Username's at the bottom of the screen. This is Kid Nerd. Man, I feel like it's been a while since I did a Kid Nerd video. When was the last time Kid dropped? Uh, not long enough. Not long. Two months. But welcome back, man. That is a long time in the world of YouTube. Anyway, this is um, the London boy who became the most wanted in the world. I'm interested. Talk to me. Copyright disclaimer under section 107 of the Copyright Act 1976. It is no easy for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. No copyright infringement intended. All rights belong to their respective owners. It is no easy accomplishment to be wanted by several of the most powerful countries in the world. Yeah, yeah. Interpol, CIA, FBI. That's a lot of stuff. But that was the reality for a young man from West London who alongside his three friends shocked everyone. Guys, this is one of the most crazy. I'm not even gonna lie. This picture looks... Sad his three friends... This lineup looks incredibly incriminating and suspect shocked everyone guys this is one of the most craziest stories to come out of the uk so stay strapped in never heard times of crisis it is necessary to bring down a prime minister bring blair down 20th of March 2003, UK Prime Minister Tony Blair announces a military inter- 20, 2003, what was I at? I think I was just starting high school. Intervention will be taking place in Iraq. And as you can probably tell, Wait, the military- of March 2003, UK Prime Minister Tony Blair announces a military intervention will be taking place in Iraq. And as you can probably tell, the decision wasn't too popular in the country. It all started on the 11th of September 2001, after an Afghanistan-based terror group who went by the name of Al-Qaeda executed one of the most shocking and world-changing terror attacks in right. New York. Right. Today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. In the response, the US declared global war on terrorist organizations, which began with an Afghanistan invasion in 2001, and drone strikes in Pakistan, Yemen and Somalia some years after. Back in the UK, anti-war protests started emerging through the country, and while polls showed that around 60% of the British public supported the invasion of Iraq. It was clear many were strongly opposed, especially by many of UK's Muslim residents who believed the US. You know, I just want to take this moment to say Kid Nerd is a pioneer in this this genre of documentary style stuff. As far as I'm concerned, you know what I'm saying? I ain't never start. Kid Nerd spawned this for me, at least, watching documentary. US had other motives, especially by many of UK's Muslim residents who believed the US had other motives in Muslim majority countries. The outrage was a perfect opportunity for Islamic extremists to build a rapid burst of support, capitalizing on the worries of UK's Muslim communities. One notably being a man who went by the name of Abdullah El Faisal, a British Jamaican Muslim convert who despite living in the UK, absolutely hated everything it stood for. Abdullah became a popular figure for many extreme young- But why not leave then? Why, why live somewhere you absolutely hate? 
<laughs> I don't understand. Interesting. Young Muslims in London. His followers were drawn to his charismatic and inflammatory preaching, which came as a beacon of light for many feeling alienated in Western society. But Abdullah had a dark plan. A plan to make the UK go up in flames. Abdullah called for young Muslims to take revenge on the UK for their involvement in the Iraq war, spreading his message through pre-recorded tapes, which could be bought in underground bookshops. One young man who became infatuated by El Faisal's preaching was a 19-year-old called Jermaine Lindsay, who just like El Faisal was a Jamaican-born Muslim convert who would end up taking part in Britain's most infamous terror attack, heavily inspired by El Faisal's teachings. I really know nothing about this because I'm I'm really at the edge of my seat because I don't know nothing. What happened? Oh, okay. Reports are just coming in of an explosion at Liverpool Street Station here in London. I think I heard it. Is. All of London's transport is currently disabled or, or stopped, whether that's buses or trains. So on the 7th of July 2005, four British men, including Jermaine, will let okay, off suicide bombs here. around London's transport system, killing 52 that. people and injuring nearly 800 more, making it the worst terror incident in the UK since 1988 and the first from so-called Islamic terrorists. The aftermath was damaging. Islamophobia was at an all-time high, resulting in disturbing attacks on Muslim civilians and places of worship. But extremist views was also on the rise, with some having the view that the bombing was simply revenge for war crimes committed in the Middle East. This growing divide in opinion saw the rise in far-right groups on both sides of the spectrum, groups who were fighting against multiculturalism and immigration. <laughs> One thing about England, they're going to chant something. They're going to put them chants. Go ahead. And groups who were starting to fight to implement Islamic law in Britain. Following the bombing, it wasn't rare to see both sides carrying out protests on the streets of London. Implement Islamic law in Britain? I need a little bit more context to that statement. What do you mean? What is... Which often would end up in some type of violence. I'm One of the worst... The, I'm lost at the whole concept of that. I don't get it. Implement an Islamic law in Britain. Clashes being on the 11th of September 2011, exactly 10 years what after law? the tragic 9-11 attacks in America, in what was meant to be a day of mourning and respect for the victims who had lost their lives just a decade before turned into a pit of chaos outside of the US Embassy in central London. At 8.46am, a radical Islamic group who went by the name of Muslims Against Crusades begins a protest outside of the US Embassy where they were seen burning American flags and expressing their frustrations with US foreign policies. At the scene, they were later met by an anti-Islamic group of protesters which you can probably tell didn't go too well, yeah, nice. ending with two people being stabbed. Two of the men originally arrested for the stabbing was a 27-year-old called Alexander Cote and a 22-year-old called El Shafif El Sheikh, both from West London. They never faced any charges for the stabbing but was both put on police's radar and for right reasons. El Sheikh was only five years old when his family fled to the UK from the country of I think they let him go and didn't charge him for the stabbings just to monitor him and see if it, it got any crazier. Like it was like a planned thing type situation. I do. See then. How they get, which how you stab somebody and don't get charged? Like the time was when his family fled to the UK from the country of Sudan, which at the time was riddled with political instability. He lived a relatively standard life in the UK. He had a decent social life and was an avid football fan. But friends and family started noticing changes in his behaviour. 
after he faced a life-threatening situation in 2008. In this year, El Sheikh was stabbed multiple times outside of his house in the state by a local drug dealer, which resulted in a series of violent spats between El Sheikh's older brother and the dealer who stabbed him named Craig Brown, ending when Craig was shot and killed outside of his girlfriend's house by the end of the year. After it all died down, Gonna lie, bro. Brother spun for him. He spun until the end of the beef, <laughs> until it was done. I don't condone violence, but. El Sheikh started getting closer to Islam and started attending a local mosque in West London called the Al Manar Center. This specific mosque was actually funded and set up by the government in 2001 as part of a new wave of Islamic centers supported by local councils. But troubles started arising in Al Manar a couple years after its opening. In the early 2000s, a mosque around 30 minutes away in the area of Finsbury Park was subjected to a major police raid, which uncovered multiple weapons, forged documents and extremist literature, oh, wow. leaving a bad stain on the place of worship. To clean up his image, the mosque expelled one of their main leaders, a man named Abu Hamza, who became renowned for his open support on terrorist activities. His whole outfit is giving, I ain't even gonna lie. After he was expelled, many of his loyal Worrisome. followers left with him and some relocated to the Almanar Center, bringing their extremist ideas with them. With the new arrivals, it wasn't long till Almanar would be plagued with the same issues that faced Finsbury Park. While attending the Al Manar Center, El Sheikh started getting closer to three young men also from West London. The first being a 22 year old called Mohammed Mwazi, a young man who had been radicalized by a couple friends from university. The next being 26 year old Ayn Davis, a man who was converted to radical Islam while serving a prison sentence for firearms, and Alexander Koti, a Muslim convert who unfortunately was influenced by the wrong people. These four boys will later be known as the Beatles. The Beatles? How dare they? In 2009, a civil war was breaking out in the East African country of Somalia oh, yeah. after an Islamic insurgency group called Al Shabaab planned to take over the country. For many radicalized Brits, this was a chance to fight for what they believe in. El Sheikh and his new group of friends was all in favor for the takeover and even went as far to start raising money outside of local mosques to support the militants. The group's crowdfunding quickly turned into phone and bike robberies, which they would sell and pass over any funds made to help the cause, a crime which one of the boys, Mohammed Mwazi, would actually end up being arrested for. In Somalia, the militants had some early success, with the terrorists quickly snapping up much of the south of the country. So eight months into the civil war, Mohammed Mwazi decided to take it the next step further and join the fighting in Somalia. In August 2009, Mwazi took a string of flights, first from London to Amsterdam and then from Amsterdam to Tanzania, with the goals of eventually reaching Somalia. But while flying to Tanzania, flight attendants described Mwazi's behaviour on the plane as suspiciously aggressive and drunk like which resulted in him being refused entry into the country. While at the border control, Mwazi got desperate and attempted to barge through border forces, which earned him a night in jail. Yeah, you're going to jail, buddy. I'm going right back to the UK. Before being sent back to the UK. After Al Shabaab started taking some heavy losses in the war, another flight to Somalia wasn't looking as appealing as it was before. But Mwazi's dreams to fight didn't stop there. And there was a new fight going on, one that was a much bigger threat. Back in the Middle East, after years of fighting in Iraq, the US and the UK decided to pull their troops out of the country in 2011, leaving behind a nation weak and unstable. As expected, chaos ensues and the extremist groups start rising to power in certain regions, the biggest one being a group called ISIS, who set out goals to take over- Bro, this was this, this time in history was very spooky. And you know, right now it's crazy how, like, I don't know, Maybe it seems a little bit calmer than it was. It's not as 
at the forefront because so much other stuff is being going what's going on or so much other stuff is being put in front of us to cloud what we see and what we don't see but like i'm, I'm curious what's going on with the because i know they're not just completely done all of a sudden you know what i'm saying somebody cooking up somewhere somebody's at the drawing board doing something i would assume man and it's spooky. I know we got stuff set in set in place to to figure stuff out, but you know, I'm just this the stuff that be wild to me in real life. This is not Jason Voorhees, not Freddy Krueger, not it, but this stuff right here. This is real life spooky of the Middle East and enforce an Islamic regime, a cause that sounded like a dream to the Beatles. But Iraq wasn't the only country in the Middle East going through some problems. In fact, its neighbour Syria was facing a much worse situation. In March 2011, protests started sweeping through Syria in response to a population not happy with their ruling dictator. These protests quickly escalate to a full-scale civil war, leaving ISIS with a perfect chance to begin their expansion into the country. Back in the UK, many extremists are starting to hear word of an Islamic revolution in the Middle East resulting in hundreds of radicalized Brits leaving everything behind to join the fighting in Syria. Four of these Brits being the Beatles. In 2012, I'm pretty sure a lot of them were young, impressionable men who have been done wrong by the system or, 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 or the system failed them in some way and they just wanted to exact some type of revenge. Or it just might be people that just like to go against the grain. Or just straight brainwash, who knows? Of one by one, El Sheik, Mwazi, Danes, and Koti all make their way to the front line of Syria, where they will begin their descent into a path of sheer destruction. When they reached Syria, the Beatles came under leadership of a commander called Abu Omar al Shashani, a young man who had a lot in common with the four boys. Just like the Beatles, Shashani started his path in extremism in Europe in the small country of Georgia. So Shoshani took the Beatles under his wing, but he took a special liking to one of the boys, 23-year-old Mohammed Mwazi. Mwazi idolized Shoshani and quickly became one of his most favorite soldiers for his willingness to do anything asked of him, which would come in handy for Shoshani's future plans. On the 19th of- He used him as a straight guinea pig, a crash dummy, didn't he? I'm already Noah. July 2012, the biggest and most decisive battle in Syria started taking place. Rebels, which included ISIS and Al Qaeda, began their conquest. I had a lot of Assyrian, like Syrian homies, like where I like some friends, and some were my sworn enemies. I like <laughs> just because of how everything was set up where I was at the time, but like. Like, I get, like, some of the aggression they came with now. Like, as I'm older, like, I didn't get it at first. Like, why bro so aggressive? Why he so down bad? Why he think he's so tough? This was it. This is it. And they was coming straight over, though. Like, we had these two twins that was from Syria, and they just didn't know how to calm down until I had to put one of them in a headlock and tell them, stop playing with me, five, five. Do something to you, buddy. <laughs> Um, you're not where you, hey, chill out, basically. <laughs> he was cool with, with me after that. Um, he was causing a lot of other people some problems, but. You know what I'm saying? I get it now. As an adult into the city of Aleppo, which included ISIS and Al-Qaeda, began their conquest into the city of Aleppo, Syria's economic capital and the most populated city in the country. The battle for the city was a complete free-for-all. Rebels backed by the US, Saudi Arabia and Turkey were going toe-for-toe -toe with the Syrian government backed by Russia and Iran. And on top of all of it, different rebel factions would also battle it out. 
Fighting over land that had been won in the city. The situation in Syria was now starting to become much more tricky. No longer was it just everyone versus the government, but now a fight for the most powerful group against the government, forcing rebel fighters and leaders to have to pick a side. Shoshani sided with ISIS, bringing the Beatles with him. Outside of Syria, the whole world was locked in on all the chaos. The war was being televised by reporters from all over the world, capturing the mayhem. But stuff started to get a bit too out of control. Civilian deaths were piling up, and many Western reporters inside of Syria started fleeing the country. By the time the Battle of Aleppo started in 2012, there was only a few... That's when Western reporters was getting kidnapped and and taking the dark rooms and put it on TV. Yeah, it was it was a real spooky time. Two Western journalists. Battle of Aleppo started in 2012. There was only a few Western journalists and aid workers who was willing to remain in the war zone. And ISIS had a plan. And they were brave, very selfless. Because me personally, if I was in that line of business and anything like this was going on, the first moment I got wind of it, I would have been gone. 100%. All right, y'all, listen. It's getting spooky. I did what I could. Goodbye. And for every last one of them. I'm not playing. Them. ISIS knew if they wanted to continue to dominate throughout the Middle East, they needed leverage on Western governments to stop them interfering with their plans, so decided to execute a campaign to capture every last Western civilian in the country. After working yeah, his man. way up inside ISIS, Al Shashani was assigned to oversee the operation. And with Muhammad Amwazi being one of Shoshani's most trusted men, him and his group was left to run the mission, giving Amwazi a chance to prove his worth. So throughout 2012 and 2013, the four West London boys went on a hostage campaign throughout northern Syria, imprisoning soldiers of the Syrian army, but more important to them were any Westerners who remained in the country. Apprehending these people wasn't much of an issue for the Beatles. A lot of journalists actually had some quite good relationships with many civilians and some rebel groups who wanted them to capture their side of the story to the world. But once the war started getting more intense and more lives they got to finessing. were getting lost, people started turning against the journalists which made some more than happy to turn them into captivity. The Beatles' first mission was on November the 22nd, 2012, when they captured a British journalist called John Cantley and American journalist James Foley. Both men were on their way to the Turkish border when they were suddenly stopped by the gang and arrested, eventually being taken to a two-man cell. This cell grew more and more throughout time, and by 2013, the Beatles... This why I be applauding the journalism, the YouTube journalism people, the YouTube travelers that be going to places and it be like wild stuff be going on there. Because y'all really be putting y'all life in danger. You know what I'm saying? Just to for, for our entertainment or our education, you know, to further the, our education and what's going on around the world. Like, And if any of these people on the screen lost their lives, man, R.I.P who's had a range of hostages on their hands from the most powerful countries in the world. The captives were subjected to some terrible conditions. They were starved to near death, beaten without reason, and used to play out the Beatles' sick fantasies. The group garnered up such a reputation for their harsh punishments that superiors had to warn them multiple times not to kill the prisoners. The gang took much of their inspiration from what they heard about Guantanamo Bay, which was a controversial US prison which held and tortured suspected terrorists before they had even been proven guilty of any crimes. In their eyes, this was revenge for their fellow terrorists being mistreated across the ocean. It was during this period that the group received the, the audacity is insane. Their infamous name, the Beatles, originally used as a nickname amongst prisoners to differentiate them from the rest. The name was given in reference to the four-man British rock band, also known as the Beatles, mainly due to their British accents and their tight bond. The hostages also assigned each member to a name that mirrored the member of the rock band. Muhammad Amwazi was given the name John, 
after John Lennon, the leader of the Beatles. Just like John Lennon, Mwazi was seen as the leader of the Beatles terror group. The other three would often take orders from him, and he was well respected in the ISIS organization. El Sheikh took the name of George. He was described as the most violent in the group, punishing hostages for his own entertainment. Alexander Cote was Ringo. Prisoners said that he was the preacher of the group, still violent, but was said to often try to rationalize what they were doing to them. And finally, Ain Davis was Paul. He played a much smaller role, guarding the hostages while they were in their cells. These four boys amassed a serious reputation That's amongst crazy. ISIS hostages and soon will be known all over the world. I'm not gonna lie, if I was the Beatles, I'd be pressed. <laughs> On the war front, ISIS started taking some heavy losses in Aleppo. The Syrian army started encircling the city, and important rebel leaders started fleeing the area. So the Beatles also started planning their move out. On their hands, they had over 20 Western hostages and hundreds of Syrian prisoners of war. Before they escaped from the city, they killed around 300 of their Syrian prisoners, which they deemed to have no use for, but kept their western hostages and made their way to the city of Raqqa, which was an ISIS strong. So if they were in transact, if they were going to move anyway, why kill, why not just let them go? Y'all moving anyway, it's not like they can give intel on where, who, what, when, where you, you're moving. But I guess that's not how they was thinking, I guess. That's tough. And that's their own people, 300 Syrian, wait, go back. Around 300 of their Syrian war. Before they escaped from the city, they killed around 300 of their Syrian prisoners, which they deemed to have no use for, but kept their Western hostages and go. made their way to the city of Raqqa, which was an ISIS stronghold. Despite some heavy losses in Aleppo, ISIS was still desperate to expand their territory. But ISIS knew if they wanted to grow, they needed more funding and more soldiers. This was a job for a high-ranking jihad, who went by the name of Amr al-Absi, the leader of ISIS's media and propaganda propaganda department. Al Absi sickly promoted ISIS off as a dreamland with a great community with endless He looked like uh what's dude name? He kind of favors Russell Brand opportunities. He used social media like no other terrorist group before, using fighters from all over the world to attract their country's audiences and to make the group look more relatable to people who had no familiarity with the Middle East. And shockingly, it Bro was out here like infomercial. He was out here really doing this like an infomercial actually worked. Tens of thousands of people started to flock to Syria at an alarming really? rate, with hopes to be part of what they thought was going to be a new and improved world. But while Al Absi had other foreign fighters working on getting people in ISIS, he had a much more sinister and sick plan for the Beatles, one that would make them the poster boys for ISIS in the West. Back home, hostage families were left puzzled on what had happened to their loved ones. It had been over a year since the first captives had been taken, and still there was no information on who took them and if they were even still alive. That was until November the 26th, 2013, when the family of one of the hostages named James Foley receives a random encrypted email, which will read the following. Hello. We have James and we want to negotiate for him. If you want cooperation, we have rules. Going on to say we want money fast. The rest of the hostage families will receive similar emails throughout the next few weeks. The Beatles could prove they had the hostages in their possession through a proof of life process. They would ask families to send over three personal questions that only their loved ones would know the answers to. When answers came back, there was no doubt they were speaking to the right. So it's like like the security questions you put in for a website that you're that you're a member of that's crazy people. Now the only issue was to meet the requirements requested for their release. Muhammad Amwazi orchestrated the negotiations and was well aware the price certain governments would be willing to pay for the freedom of their citizens. Negotiations started off higher with the demand of 100 million euros per hostage or the release of specific convicted terrorists Wait, who were in US prison. 100 million euros per hostage? 
Nations. But not every country was willing to pay under ISIS terms. See, since around the 1970s, the US and the UK both had policies in place which prevent them from negotiating with terrorists. So despite both countries having multiple citizens who was held with the possibility of release, both governments ultimately refused to take part in brokering a deal, with the view that negotiating with ISIS directly funds their regime and encourages more hostage taken. This conflicted with the interests of other European countries who wanted their people home no matter what. Like After sense, some though. back and forth negotiating, the first three hostages to be released was three Spanish journalists in March 2014. The Spanish government and ISIS came to an undisclosed agreement for their freedom, which set an example to other European nations that negotiations were effective. Other countries would soon follow suit. French, Italian, Danish and German journalists this and aid workers were all released after paying ransoms worth millions, while the UK and the US stood firm on their no-negotiation policy. On the battlefield, Dang. ISIS were now starting to become a larger threat. They were now starting to capture significant towns in Iraq and expand into nearby Kurdistan. Fearing the worst, the Iraqi government asked America to begin airstrikes against ISIS in areas they took over. So on August the 7th, they was dancing? Of 2014, President Obama announces he will be doing just that, which unfortunately will be a final nail in the coffin for US and UK hostages. Desperate and losing hope, the family of American journalist James Foley pleads with ISIS through email attempting to get through to whatever compassion they may have left. But only five days after Obama makes his announcement, James Foley's family will receive an email that will close James's fate. They sent pictures? Well, the Foley family is sharing this email that it received from James Foley's captors, giving his employer Global Post permission to make it public. They hope it offers insight into the motives and the mindset of this terrorist group. In a raised field message thought to be typed by Amwazi, Foley's family learned that due to U.S. intervention in Iraq, James will be executed. What followed this email would be one of the most gruesome videos the world had ever seen. On the 19th of August 2014, the internet was in a frenzy. A video titled A Message to America started flooding through Twitter. In the video, we see a man who we now know is Muhammad Mwazi standing beside the visible. I don't, even, I don't wanna see it, buddy. <laughs> broken down James Foley. What happens next will send chills around the globe. Foley was brutally beheaded by Amwazi at the end of the clip sparking widespread outrage around the world. But Mwazi what? didn't stop there. Two weeks later, he strikes again in a new video, this time executing American journalist Stephen Sotloff. In the next few months, a further three beheadings will be recorded and shared online. Anytime the UK or the US made any moves or statements, You know how Twitter get, they don't take down nothing. Statements that ISIS didn't like. A new That's execution crazy. would be carried out. For the first time in a long time, the US and the UK were not in a position of power, which just like ISIS planned, caused chaos outside of the Middle East. ISIS's plan was now to capitalize on their newfound spotlight and cause an international uprising while they had the whole world watching. On September the 22nd, 2014, an ISIS spokesman called Abu Mohammed Adani releases a significant speech that called for widespread violence against Western countries and their citizens. Two days after the announcement, a French tourist is beheaded in Algeria by ISIS supporters, with mass attacks following in Australia and France in the weeks after. ISIS was now seen as a level of threat that no other group had been before. Yeah, and I remember these times. That's what I'm telling you, man. This is... This is some spooky stuff. I just said it earlier, man. This is a spooky time in history, and I don't think everybody is, you know what I'm saying? They're just underground and hiding somewhere, bro. The masked up man who the media was now calling Jihadi John was one of the most wanted men in the world. Inside ISIS, Mwazi was seen as a legend. He became a symbol for Western defection and quickly developed a disturbing fandom around the world. For quite a long time after his first time on the screen, no one actually knew what Jihadi John's real identity was. It was difficult to decipher due to his face always being 
being covered during videos, with the only clue to who it may be was John's thick London accent. Initial thoughts was that it could be a man who went by the name of El Ginny, who was a London rapper turned extremist that ran to Syria sometime in 2013, but soon they would have their suspect. After narrowing down potential suspects from London, UK's counter-terrorist team began voice analysis on videos featuring Jihadi John, comparing his voice to individuals suspected of joining ISIS. During this process, they would find a match to a particular bit of audio dating back to 2009. Now, if you remember from earlier on in the video, when Amwazi was deported from Tanzania, on his way to join the civil oh yeah when he was on that drunk outburst war in somalia on his return back to the uk he was interrogated by uk's mm. counter-terrorist team Mwazi's voice in the interrogation ended up matching with the voice of jihadi johns making him a key suspect in the case Mwazi's body structure height and eyes also matched jihadi johns making it clear that they were looking in the right direction in January 2015, six months after his first online appearance, Jihadi John carries out two further executions on camera, this time being two Japanese citizens named Haruna Yakuwa and Kenji Gold. out there doing the most? increasing public pressure to know who was responsible for these brutal attacks. So on February the 26th, 2015, it was announced that Mohammed Amwazi was the man behind the mask, finally putting a name and face to the infamous Jihadi John. Now they had their man, it was time to catch him. US and UK intelligence officers knew Amwazi was in the Syrian city of Raqqa. It was just- What branch specifically? Just a matter of where. A joint operation began to take place and everything within the borders of Raqqa was investigated. Cell phone calls and internet activity was monitored by the minute and eventually they will find their match. Investigators started closing in on someone who seemed near obs- Yeah, that internet, that, that data trail gonna get- Obsessed you. with the name of Jihadi John through web searches. So much that it could only be Jihadi John himself. So both the UK and the US sent out drones- The clout, uh, I know this is like a whole very serious thing, but that clout got him jammed up, got him triangulated. Mm. Well, all the way over there, still looking for, for, for uh, recognition. Drones to monitor the individual's every movement. And sure enough, it was Muhammad and Wazi who they had in their sights. After a few days of stalking his every action, the US were happy enough to make their move on the 12th of November 2015. At around 11 pm, a US drone begins tracking Mwazi as he moves through the streets of Raqqa in a Toyota Land Cruiser until Mwazi reaches a remote area where the drone will strike. At 11.40 p.m., two Hellfire missiles are launched towards Mwazi's vehicle, killing him instantly and ending his reign of terror. And now with him gone, it was time to find the other three Beatles, which surprisingly happened much quicker than expected. The same day of Mohammed Mwazi's death, Turkish intelligence received a tip-off that several members of ISIS had been hiding in a property near the Turkish-Syrian border. So police carried out a raid on the house, where they discovered multiple firearms and ammunition, but more importantly, a second member of the Beatles, Mr. Ain Daves. Originally, he was detained on the suspicion of being part of a terrorist organization, but after further investigations into Davis' phone, evidence showed that he was a member of the four-man hostage group. Then there was two left, Alexander Koti and El Shafif El Sheikh. El Sheikh was already suspected to be a member of the group in 2014, after his older brother was on remand for possession of a firearm. During the investigation into his brother's case, police managed to gain access into his phone, which showed pictures and messages between El Sheikh and his brother, detailing his time inside Syria. 
But the real evidence came due to one of the hostages' incredible memory. One prisoner told investigators about a conversation he heard between two Beatles members about getting arrested on the 11th of September 2011 after a stabbing. And if you remember from earlier on in the video, yeah. both Alexander Coty and El Sheik was arrested yeah, for a stabbing yeah. on that same day. Intelligence officers thought this was too much to be a coincidence, so put the that's crazy because during interrog interrogation they tell you here listen listen get as much information as you can right two men at the top of the list of suspects by the end of 2017 isis were in a bad state they had lost 95 percent of his captured territory and now many fighters were planning their escape Koti and El Sheikh being part of them. On the 24th of January 2018, both men attempted to blend in with a group of civilian refugees who were heading for a Turkish refugee camp. But luckily, the pair were spotted by Syrian forces and arrested on the spot. And now it was their time to face justice. The UK wanted nothing to do with the two men, so stripped them of their British citizenship. Yeah, definitely. But the US was very much interested in having them. America wanted to make an example out of the boys and let the world know that American citizens are not to be played with. After two years of appealing their case, both men were extradited to America, where both will plead guilty to four counts of conspiracy to murder, receiving eight concurrent life sentences. Ain Davis will get off much lighter being sentenced to seven and a half years in a Turkish prison before being extradited to the UK to serve a further eight years meaning that he will likely be out before the decade ends let me know what you guys think about God, eight life sentences consecutively in American prisons oh it's rough all of this in the comments and as always it's been your boy kid it's definitely nerd and peace out man welcome back kid nerd I ain't know nothing about nothing and I appreciate you bringing the knowledge for me, man.